Hi everybody, I'm Tim from TroutandFeather.com and in this episode of From Vice to Water, I'm going to talk about some ways in which I fish larger dry flies. Stay tuned. Let's get started with this episode of From Vice to Water. Whenever I mention larger dry flies, what I mean are those dry flies that are found in sizes 8, 10, 12, maybe a 14 if it's a 2XL or a 3 extra long shank. Basically, those patterns that take up a lot of space in our fly boxes. These aren't flies that we're going to be using 5X or 6X with. We're talking the 3X and the 4X patterns. Now, I've tied a lot of these on my YouTube fly tying tutorials, and I'll put links to all the following flies in the description of this video. The flies that I'm talking about are those that are similar to the Madam X, the Irresistibles, the Stimulator, the White Wolves of the world, the Tan Adams, those larger dry flies that will just sometimes elicit incredible strikes from trout in moving water. Now, whenever I think a little bit more in depth about these larger dry flies, there's a time and a place for them. And that's what I really want to help illustrate during this video. That time, it's, it's really easy for me to sit here and say, oh, geez, you want to fish this larger dry fly right before dusk. And that's a great time to fish them because both the fish can see them and we can see them really well. But there are definitely opportunities to fish these patterns all throughout the day, though sometimes that place will dictate that. And by place, I'm talking about different water types, different seams, different locations on moving waters for trout. And that's what I intend to discuss during this tutorial. So I'm going to break this into three parts because I kind of think about fishing these larger dry flies three ways. Part one will be solo fly fishing of this dry fly. Part two will be the dry dropper. And then part three is going to be a continuation. It's going to be a fishing tandem dry flies, but it's going to be pairing this larger dry fly with a really small one that's probably pretty tough to see on the water. So let's get started with that first section, fishing these by themselves. Now let's just start this off by talking about fishing these big dry flies by themselves. Since you don't have a second pattern attached to the bend of the hook, you don't have to worry about opening up your casts. Instead, you can be a lot more direct and very intentional with this solo large dry fly on. You can put this fly in some, we'll say some spots and some little situations in which you wouldn't otherwise go for if you had two patterns on. The tippet that I love to use whenever I'm fishing these larger dry flies is 3X or 4X, never any smaller than that. And there's a few situations in which I typically will turn to these larger patterns. The first one is whenever I have very fast moving water. I'm not talking about just this blown out riffle or anything along those lines, but I'm talking about water that's moving at a decent pace and it has a little riprap on it. Water that's six inches to about two and a half or three feet deep. Whenever I get to water like that, and I'm going to be fishing this fly all by itself, I like to start at the bottom of this little run and work my way up. Now, if one side is definitely a lot shallower than the other, then I'll work my way up the shallow side, basically making casts across and up and trying to hit that far bank. If the center is shallower, and I really prefer it to be, then I can work my way up the center, making casts to the left and to the right. So I really love using this in fast water. Second, I love to use these larger dry flies whenever I'm kind of just out there searching and there's not a lot going on. Whenever I want to cover a lot of water in a quick amount of time, I'll put on just one large dry fly and just work my way up the center of a stream, the center of a river, and just pound the banks with these flies. Just constantly getting them into those little divots, those little edges that I know I can just put a cast in, count to two or three, and if that fish doesn't take, immediately pick it up, dry it off, take a few steps up, and put another cast out. So I love to cover a lot of water with these, fit, with these flies on and fish will respond aggressively. And I'm talking about in the middle of the day as well. That's a really great thing to keep in mind with these larger dry fly patterns. And then finally, I, if I'm fishing at dusk and I'm having a lot of trouble seeing smaller flies on the water, I will immediately just go to a larger dry fly. And by going to that larger size, I can see it. I know the fish can see it. I don't worry about having a second fly on there because too many complicated things occur whenever I have two patterns on and it's getting dark. Thus, that's the third situation in which I really prefer to just keep this fly solo whenever I'm fishing these. So those are some of the situations in which I like to fish these patterns solo. Now I'm going to talk about the notion of a dry dropper, which is a heck of a lot of fun to fish. <laughs> 
this next type of fishing with large dry flies may be my most productive. And that's a setup in which we call the dry dropper. The dry dropper is just a great way to fish because you really kind of double your chances to catch fish. You have a dry fly on top of the water and then you have another fly that's being fished in a different column of water. That really puts us to a great advantage. Now during this section, I'm going to tell you about the setup that I use when fishing the dry dropper, some of my favorite patterns, and then finally the types of water in which I'll typically turn to that dry dropper setup. So to get this set up, let's um, talk about our leader and our rig. At this point, we have our standard dry fly rod. We have that standard dry fly leader that you're always using down to around a 3X or 4X tippet. You tie on that large dry fly with your favorite knot. And then next, we're going to get out some other tippet material to tie on a smaller pattern that's going to run behind and somewhere lower than this fly. It's going to be going under the surface of the water. Now let's first talk about the length of the tippet because that's something really important. The tippet that I'm using below this is going to be 4X, 5X, maybe 6X if it's a really, really small fly because I know the fish are midging. The length is really going to be determined by the depth of the water. If I'm fishing in 18 inch uh, water that's kind of a riffle and I know there's some fish nymphing off the bottom, I might have an, an 8 inch tippet that's going to be hanging off that dry fly. If it's a larger pool of water, maybe I'm fishing a pool that's three and a half feet deep, I have my dry fly floating on the surface, and I'm going to use that more like an indicator and then have maybe a 30 inch tippet that's going to be coming off attached to my dropper fly. So I really let the depth of the water dictate the length of my dropper, and I will change it quite frequently depending on the fishing situation that I come into. Now whenever I attach the dropper to that large dry fly, I first cut my tippet. I'm going to over, oversize it by a few inches just to account for the cutting of my knots. And then next, I'm going to basically put an improved cinch knot in one end of this. So we have this hanging. It's not attached to any fly yet. And I'm basically going to think of my fingers as a hook eye. So I'm just going to put that around my fingers, turn it around four to six times, just like a normal improved cinch, take the tag end, through the open loop, and when you do that, you're creating a new loop, and I want to put it back through that new loop. Now, while I'm doing this, I really have to stress that I am not a knot tier. That's not what I do, but if you Google uh, improved cinch knot, you'll probably have a much better demonstration than mine. Um, next, you're going to wet your knot, pull it tight, clip this tag end, and then I'm going to grab my large dry fly, put this loop that I just created around the bend of it, and then pull the long end. Now I have my large dry fly with that tippet cut to length hanging from it. I'm ready to tie on whatever dropper fly that I want to go with. Now I've heard other fly fishermen attach them differently. Maybe they, they tie it off of the eye of that large dry fly. That's just not something I've ever tried before. I'm not going to knock them one bit, but I've always just tied it around the, uh, the bend of the hook, pretty much right in the center or maybe in that bottom crevice, if that makes sense pulled it tight. I've never had a problem at that point, and I primarily fish barbless too, so keep that in mind. Next, let me tell you about some of my favorite flies to fish underneath that large dry fly. The large dry fly, I've already talked about my favorites in that previous segment. For these nymphs that are coming off, they're soft tackles. Those are my two primary, we'll say, large groups. I love those, those great ones, like, like the pheasant tails, the hare's ears. If I go to soft tackles, my two favorites, without a doubt, are the shaky bealy and the birds of prey caddis. And then finally, if I'm going after uh, some fish that I believe are midging, I'm going to go with the WD-40 tied with the body color to match the naturals. Now, all five of those flies I have tied in my fly tying tutorials before, and I'll put links to them down in the description of this page. And finally, let's talk about the situations in which I'll fish this type of a setup. And it's going to be primarily riffles and seams of water where uh, two different, we'll say, water types meet. We have a slow water type and a large water, I'm sorry, and a fast water type. Whenever there's that, we'll just say that current that meets right there at that breaking point, I love to fish this dry dropper setup because those are situations in which I believe you have fish that are both looking to the surface and also fish that might be working nymphs or emergers underneath that water. I love fishing riffles with these because that large dry fly acts almost like an indicator in a sense. And then finally, basically think about a lot of the situations in which you nymph. If you believe that you can put that dry fly on to act like your indicator, if you prefer to use a, a strike indicator, then try this instead of using that indicator because you're really kind of doubling your opportunities. Now, if it's March, early March, and it's raining, more than likely those fish aren't going to be coming up for this large dry fly. But once April, May, especially June hits, 
you have a great opportunity a opportunity to catch fish on the nymph, on that soft tackle, on a midge that's acting as a dropper underneath that large dry fly. And you have a great chance to catch fish on that large dry fly too. This is the second segment. I'm going to now move into the third segment, and it's fishing these large dry flies. However, we're going to pair them in tandem with a smaller dry fly. In this last setup, you're going to be fishing two dry flies in a tandem rig. And there's lots of reasons why you might have two dry flies on. For starters, you might be fishing midges, and it's really tough to see those flies on the water. Thus, you're going to have on a larger dry fly to act kind of like an indicator. The same thing might occur if you're fishing in the evenings and you know the fish are taking spinners, but it's really tough to see them 35, 40 feet away. Thus, you're going to pair them with this larger dry fly to, again, act like that indicator. But more than likely, the best reason why you're going to be fishing two dry flies is because the fish are actively feeding on top. And that's a great situation to be in, one that I know all of us love. So I'm going to talk about the setup of this rig, go into some of the patterns that I love to fish, both dry flies, and then finally talk about some of the fishing situations in which I'll turn to these two. To start off, let's think about that previous segment. We're going to have that same dry fly leader coming down to a 3x, 4x tippet, and at that point we're going to tie on our large dry fly. Then things change a little bit. Our tippet size is probably going to be 5x, 6x, or 7x, depending on the size of the fly that we're going to be using in tandem with it. That dropper fly is probably going to be anywhere between a size 16, 18, 20, 22, 24. It's going to be a smaller one than the initial dry fly. So we have to pair our tippet accordingly. Also, the length of the tippet is going to change. In this case, I always kind of get my tippet anywhere between 6 inches and 15 inches long. The reason is really simple. If I'm going to be fishing a fly that's much smaller than that larger dry fly, I'm probably not going to be able to see that smaller one on the water. Thus, if I see a fish that rises 8 inches away from my larger dry fly, I can set the hook confidently and know that there's probably going to be a fish there. But if I have a 30 inch tippet, I'm going to be setting the hook any time a fish rises 2 feet away from that large dry fly, and I'll probably be scaring a lot of fish. I'm going to be attaching that tippet to that large dry fly the same way. I'm going to use that improved cinch knot, and then put that loop around the bend of the hook, tighten it there, and then tie that accordingly onto whatever fly I'm going with. So it's going to be a very similar rig with the difference being the size of the tippet and the length of the tippet. Next, let's talk about some of the patterns that we really love to fish with that larger dry fly. Now sometimes it might be just whatever that mayfly is that's hatching or that caddis fly. But there's other situations in which I'm going to be turning to some other patterns that I really love to use and catch a lot of fish. For instance, one of them is a deer hair ant. I love fishing these small black deer hair ants, but they're really tough to see on the water. They're much easier to see when I have them paired with a larger dry fly. The same thing goes for a Griffith's gnat. It's an absolutely incredible midge, and it works really well, but it can be tough to see on the water. And then finally, I love to fish spinners into the dusk as it gets dark. However, it's really tough to see them. I've experimented with some of that glow-in-the-dark stuff, and it works to an extent, but I'd much rather pair them with a large dry fly because not only can I then see that large dry fly, have it act as an indicator, but we're also forgetting you can catch a fish on it as well, and I've caught a lot of big fish at dusk on that large dry fly. Now, there's many situations in which we can fish two dry flies. For starters, just think about that spot that you always go to that you love to fish dry flies. You know fish are rising, they're taking emergers, they're sipping off the surface. That's a great situation in which you can fish two. Now, there's a couple more, we'll say, fish-specific or we'll say species-specific in a sense. I mentioned that deer hair ant. Now, I love to fish deer hair ants, but I prefer to fish them along the edges of the stream because more than likely that's where they're initially falling in. They're falling out of trees, they're falling out of shrubbery. Thus, I like to walk up the center of a stream, the center of a river, and then take that, that cast, take this tandem rig that has on two dry flies, that second one being a deer hair ant, and just pound those banks with those terrestrials. Thus, I have that larger one, which could represent a drake, an isonychia, a stonefly possibly, depending on how fast the water is, but then I'm pairing it with a deer hair ant, which is perfect for that type of location. Finally, one of my favorite spots to fish these two dry flies is in fast moving water that's no more than two feet, maybe two and a half feet deep at the maximum. Now I like to fish that fast moving water right after it drains from a slow moving pool. Because in those situations you have opportunities 
for many insects to be hatching. You could have stoneflies that are popping out of that fast-moving riffle, but you could also have midges that are being carried from that slow-moving water above. Thus, if you pair something like a Griffith's gnat with a large, darker, size 10, black-looking stonefly pattern that's floating on top, you have some great opportunities to go after some fish that are going to come up with aggressive strikes in that water. So that's, without a doubt, my favorite way to fish that these larger dry flies is pairing them with a second dry fly and I love being in those situations because you can experiment a little bit and catch a lot of fish on top which is what I love to do. Well as always thanks for watching this video this is part of my series which is called From Vice to Water and this is a series in which I really help you not only just tie the fly but then move into that next step what do you do now that you have that fly how are you going to fish it and I hope this video helps with those larger dry flies. All the flies that I mentioned in this video I have tied previously and I've listed them all in the description of this YouTube video. As always, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact me. You can leave a comment in the comment section below or email me at tkamisa at gmail.com. Finally, if you'd like to view any of my additional YouTube videos, you can view them on my website, which is troutandfeather.com. I also have a Facebook page and it'd be great if you could like it. As always, everybody, thank you so much for watching this video and I look forward to hearing from all of you.